Hi, my name's Phil, I like talking about politics and in this video I'd like to finally discuss the Scottish election results which were on paper the most impactful of all the elections that took place last week. I'll be discussing what it means for the Scottish independence referendum and what the arguments will be now. But first, if you'd like to be notified of daily news and politics, please subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification icon. So the uh, fallout from the elections in England continues to get even crazier. So I'll have more to say about that again tomorrow. I think what I need to do is to write it down, calm down and then do it tomorrow. <laughs> um, I might even need to spend like a video a day on these for the rest of the week and then and then another one on Brexit, although I assume that's going to be probably linked. Um, but there we go. But today, the Scottish elections. Now, this is actually my happy place right now. I'm not happy that the SNP did as well as they did, although, you know, it could have been a lot worse. I'm not happy at the prospect of my country being torn apart. But right now, politics in Scotland is at least normal. So it's my happy place. You know, we had, for example, um, an SNP candidate who won, uh, racially abused. And then candidates from other parties basically showed solidarity with him um, to, to chase them off. I could begin on, on a similar line with Jada Franson, standing for a group that Nicola Sturgeon famously called out last week for being racist and fascist and how the people of Glasgow Southside would reject her. Well, reject her, they did. The First Minister won 19,735 votes, whilst Jada Franson won 46. 46 votes. I mean, of course, you know, she wasn't going to win. But 46, I mean, that 46 is getting some drunks round the pub to vote for you if the polling station just so happens to be next door. That's what that result is. I reckon I could manage more than that. Just make up a party with an entertaining name, do a bit of promotion, and in a hotly contested election where there's plenty of turnout, I'm pretty sure I'd get more than 46. I don't think I would get my deposit back, but I would be disappointed to get as few as 46, even as a joke candidate. But anyway, more important matters. The SNP fell short of an overall majority, but that doesn't mean they don't have the legislative power to go ahead with a new referendum bill. Now, I thought the way I would do this with a little bit of a debate, a to and fro with myself, alternating arguments forwards and backwards over this. And it's not really a debate with myself because I've said before that there already existed a mandate for a new referendum. I didn't even think it needed this election to confirm it, but I will explain how it, it is better that it has happened afterwards. But still, here we go. So, before the election, SNP leader and First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, said that her party you know, if it won an outright majority, she would press ahead with a bill in Parliament for another referendum. So the SNP have in the past had an outright majority. They haven't anymore, uh, or they didn't in the last Parliament. So she said if in this Parliament they gain one, and the poll sort of said it would be finely balanced, give or take a seat, they said. It was actually on the cards for them to get that outright majority. She said that would be the mandate for another independence referendum. Now, this is important because we have to ask, was her statement meaningful or vacuous? Which really is something that should be asked of all politicians. Whenever they say they will do something, particularly if there's a qualifier, are they saying anything of impact? Is what they're saying worth saying? Because if Sturgeon said she'd go ahead with the bill, with the qualifier being that she had an outright majority, then what is the implication for what happens if she doesn't get that majority? Obvious, you don't need to play any linguistic gymnastics here. It means the implication is if she doesn't get that majority, she doesn't go ahead with the bill. But of course, she is going ahead with it. And so she should, by the way. People will point out that her statement was therefore pointless at best and misleading at worst. OK, sure. Politicians are tricksy. Any successful politician has to get their hands dirty. Doesn't mean to say we have to just accept it, but it's the way it is. Of course, some of them get it dirty with mud and others with blood, but none of them get to keep their hands clean if they are to win. But here's where Boris Johnson messed up badly. Now, I've talked about this before, but I'll remind people. Last year, he was advised, last year, 
to agree to another referendum if the SNP won an outright majority in these elections. And I don't mean advised by people from the outside. He was given this advice by his own advisers, the people he chose to advise him, the people who have his interests and the interests of his continued leadership at heart. He ignored them. Now, I can almost guarantee that Boris Johnson will say, in fact, I can guarantee it because Michael Gove has already said it. He will say that he doesn't have to agree to another referendum because the SNP didn't get the majority and therefore they have no mandate. He is likely to point out that Sturgeon said that she would go ahead if she got a majority, the implication being that she wouldn't if she didn't. But he could have got more than that implication. If Boris Johnson had done as he was advised and said, OK, you know, fair enough. If, if the SNP get an outright majority, then I agree that that is a mandate for another referendum and I will not stand in your way. Sturgeon would have had to accept the challenge. She would have had to explicitly accept that challenge. But the thing is, he didn't do that. And so he never trapped Sturgeon into agreeing that there shouldn't be a mandate for that if she didn't get an outright majority. Because what some people may be missing here is there is a majority in Holyrood for that referendum. See, it's not just the SNP that want the referendum. You know, they have fallen short of their overall majority. They are one seat short. But the Greens will support it and they have enough seats to tip it over. And here is where the elections are both important and unimportant. See, the elections were unimportant because the SNP, the SNP sorry, plus the Greens already had a majority in the previous parliament. It's a slightly increased majority now. The SNP gained one seat, the Greens gained two, I think. So the majority is increased by three. But that majority was there beforehand. You know, there was a majority before without the SNP having an outright majority. And there's a majority now without the SNP having an outright majority. There's no real difference in the parliamentary arithmetic in practical terms. So in theory, nothing has really happened to say that the mandate didn't exist before, but does now. You could either say, well, it did before or it doesn't now. Well, that's just one way of looking at it. There is, the elections were important in that these were the first elections that are post-Brexit. And I don't just mean post-leaving the EU. The previous parliament was formed in 2016 before the Brexit referendum. Now, at the time, we knew the Brexit referendum was going to happen. But back then, the expectation is that we would remain in the EU, that we would vote to remain. You know, there had just been a Scottish referendum not long before, which had been defeated. So people could vote SNP or Green without necessarily supporting another referendum on independence. So this election was important in confirming that Scot to Scottish voters, oh, by the way, when you're voting for, for us, be clear you are voting for another referendum. So people voting for either the SNP or the Greens this time around were definitely voting for an independence referendum. You know, that was explicitly stated. Now, some people may say they weren't, but that's a little bit like saying you voted for Brexit, but you didn't vote for the consequences of Brexit, including the potential breakup of the UK itself. You did that. You may not have meant to, but you did actually vote for this. Now, pro-referendum parties have a majority in the Scottish Parliament. So the mandate is very much there. Then another counter argument. So although the pro-referendum parties have a majority in Holyrood, they did not gain a majority of the votes in either the constituency or the region voting. That means a majority of people voted for candidates opposed to another referendum. Now, there's two thoughts about that. The first is to say that the last Westminster elections also resulted in a majority of votes going to parties opposed to leaving the EU without another referendum. That didn't stop us leaving on almost the hardest terms possible without that confirm confirmatory referendum. Going back even further, 2015, the, the majority of people voted for parties opposed to even a Brexit referendum voted for parties against a Brexit referendum, and yet we still got the Brexit referendum. So Conservatives especially do not get to claim that they don't have a mandate because they didn't get a majority of the votes, because neither have they. You know, this is how first past the, poli the post politics works. And yes, Scottish elections are not entirely first past the post, but they are mostly. But then the second thought, and I think really the more important one, 
is that this isn't really a big deal in this case. See, the bill is not to break up the UK. The bill is not to have Scotland leave the UK. It's to issue another referendum. If the majority of Scotland are really opposed to it, that's fine, they can just vote against independence. You know, the less than 50% of voters are not splitting Scotland away from the UK in the same way that the less than 50% of voters in 2019 split the UK away from the EU. They just want a referendum, that's all. If the majority are against independence, they will vote against it. There's no voter suppression going on in Scotland. They even allow 16 year olds to vote. It will be as representative a vote as there has ever existed in the UK's centuries spanning history of democracy. So now we come to the mechanics of the situation. So before all results were declared, but when it became clear that the SNP plus the Greens would have a majority together, Sturgeon said that she would be putting a bill for the new referendum through Parliament and that if Boris Johnson wanted to stop it, he would have to take it to the Supreme Court. Oh, bit of a challenge there. And, and this is what I've been saying for well over a year now. See, people keep saying, to, whenever I've approached this subject, people keep behaving as if it's up to Westminster to decide on whether or not a referendum can be issued. But that is basically saying that Scotland do not have the legal right to self-determination. But I kept saying, we do not know this to be the case. Until it is tested in a constitutional court, because it's never been tested before. You can never be certain about any legal point until it's been tested in a relevant court. I mean, who writes laws at the end of the day? Politicians. Some politicians have got some legal training. Doesn't mean to say they're an expert in the area of legislation that they're legislating for. But, the va but at the end of the day, no one in Parliament, uh, you know, gives up their votes to the legal experts. They all use their own vote according to their own politics. Laws are passed in this country on the back of people who require no qualifications whatsoever. None at all. None. So, for the law that's passed in Parliament to actually do what Parliament intended it to do, that has to be tested in court. So what we have is the test of self-determination that I've been anticipating since the end of 2019 now, or at least coming up, because it will have to be tested in court. Michael Gove, who's the most senior Scot in the UK government, was doing an interview yesterday in which he was asked if Scotland should have the rights to decide to leave the UK. Oh, yes, he said, of course. Oh, so how do they do that, he was asked. Well, you have another referendum. Oh, so the Westminster government will allow the referendum to go ahead then. Oh, <laughs> no, 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 he said. And of course, this is where you should have been hammered. It says, OK, so tell me how you've said Scotland have the right to self-determination. They have the right to decide. You tell me how they do that. And don't tell me a referendum when you've just said then they can't have one. But anyway, that didn't happen, of course, it didn't it was on the BBC. The thing is, the SNP didn't get a majority, therefore a majority of Scots don't want it. Now, I've already pointed out the lie in this argument, but that's irrelevant. That's what the government is saying, that's what Michael Gove is saying, that is what Boris Johnson will say. The actual strength of an argument in politics has very little to do with how good an argument is objectively, but how it's perceived. You know the sorts of thing you see on social media all the time, oh, Person X absolutely destroys person B. Roughly translated, I agree with what person A said. That's all. Uh, it's all about perception. So now we'll just have to see how quickly the bill is passed. Now, before the election, I know that Ian Blackford was keen on it happening quickly. He wanted the poll to be conducted this year. Nicola Sturgeon wanted a bit more time. Now, for my money, I think Sturgeon is tactically more astute. Put it this way, see, I'm a unionist. Scotland have the right to self-determination, moral at least, and it had better be a legal right as well. I also accept that the conditions for a new referendum are more than met now. I thought they were met before, they're definitely met now. So I would like to see that referendum, and I would like for Remain to win. As such, I want that poll to take place as soon as possible. The longer we wait, the longer we allow Boris Johnson to try and deny the people of Scotland their rights, and therefore raising greater support for independence. Right now, we do not know that the referendum would be a leave win. Yes, I know people will point to polls that suggest it would be a win by a narrow margin, but more people voted for anti-referendum candidates than those in favour. Now, 
Not everyone voted on this issue, of course. That's the thing with sort of general elections as such. You vote for different things. But add on to that that you can be in favour of a referendum but would vote against independence and that absolutely it'd be a case to say Remain would win again. So as soon as possible, for my money. And I think Sturgeon would agree with my assessment, which is why I don't think she's in as much of a rush. That being said, she may not have much say. The mandate is there now, clearly there, and her party, I think, will push for this to happen very quickly. The momentum, I think, will build. So the die is cast. It now just remains to be seen how it plays out. But those are my thoughts. Let me know yours in the comments below. Hope you found the video interesting. If you did, don't forget to click the like button. And if you'd like to support the channel further, please also click the Patreon link for details. And until next time, I'll see you later.